Hello, this is Richard Thornton. We continue our series on the ancient civilizations of Mesoamerica. Today we travel to Yucatan Peninsula to the Maya city of Uxmal, which is located in the southwestern corner of Yucatan state. Uxmal was one of the first Maya cities to be rediscovered in the 1800s, but because of its remote location, even when I went to Mexico, it was difficult to access. And so it's only been in the 21st century that it's become well known. These programs on the People of One Fire channel are produced on the crest of a mountain overlooking the Coochie Valley in Northeast Georgia. Recently, Encyclopedia Britannica included an additional comment about the Coochie Valley is that it contains the largest concentration of Native American archeological sites north of Mexico. That's quite an honor. Here you see the relationship of Oshmal to other parts of Mexico. It's actually closer to the southeastern United States than most of Mexico. Oshmal is located in the northern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. It's a region that has virtually no streams or surface water. In order to gain water, one must go down into natural sinkholes or what are called cenotes to by the Mayas. Most of the color slides you're about to see were taken while I was a student at Georgia Tech. I used them for the next two years teaching classes in pre-Columbian architecture and then for the decades that followed, generally only a few were shown to uh, various classes at other universities or archaeological societies or historical societies. Most part, they sat in a tray forgotten for five decades. My travel study in Mexico was made possible by a grant from the Barrick Fellowship. Professor Ike Supporter was my uh, advisor, and it happened to be the first Barrick Fellowship. As originally conceived, the program supported a master's level research, uh, independent research. It is now merely a stipend to assist students studying overseas. The endowment for the fellowship was given by architect Sidney R. Barrett, who was a graduate of Georgia Tech and a prominent architect in Atlanta during the late 20th century. During the fellowship, I was an official guest of the Department of Foreign Relations and the Mexican government and hosted by the Museo Nacional de Antropología, one of the greatest museums in the world. My fellowship coordinator was Dr. Roman Pina Chan, who at that time was curator of the National Museum. He's considered one of the great archaeologists of the 20th century. He went on later to be director of the Instituto Nacional de Antropología and Historia de México. It was Dr. Pina Chan who first suggested to me that Maya commoners immigrated to the southeastern United States and became some of the ancestors of today's Creek Indians in Georgia. There's been very little archaeological work at Ushmal since the period when I was visiting there. So there are many unanswered questions. It probably was founded around 500 AD and most of the city's construction probably occurred between 825 and 1000 AD. This is not certain though. The city's name means built three times. As you might have already gathered, the correct pronunciation of the word is Ushmal, not Uxmal. When I visited Ushmal in 1970, there were it was in the middle of the jungle. There was nothing around it 
Today, as you can see on the right, are several resort complexes, which makes Uxmal a primary destination for tourism in Yucatan. The city was located in the Piyuk Hills region of Yucatan, which has no uh, cenotes, but also has no streams, compensating somewhat for this problem of lack of surface water that was the fact that it received heavier rainfall than farther north or even farther south in Yucatan. The urban planning of most Maya cities was quite different than what you see in central Mexico. Notice it's completely asymmetrical, almost random, and consists of a series of courtyards uh, defined by buildings uh, and punctuated by several pyramids. There are very few large formal plazas, but they did exist, uh, mainly as communication linkages between these various uh, compounds and, and walled-in plazas. This is the cover of the guide that was issued to me by the Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia. It included drawings by the architects from 1959, which was a guide to restoring all the buildings at Uxmal. As it turned out, by 1970, only the, some facades had been restored, and the pyramid portion of the Pyramid of the Magician had just been completed when I arrived. As you can have seen, a comparison of the drawing from 1840 and a color slide I took in 1970. Prior to any restoration work, Uxmal was already in better condition than most archaeological sites in Mexico. The reason is not clear, but the fact that it is not in an earthquake zone and somewhat removed from the direct impact of hurricanes may be two factors. It could also be that Uxmal's architects were just more skilled in creating long-lasting structures. As can be seen by another one of his drawings, English architect, artist, and explorer Frederick Catherwood was the first person to thoroughly illustrate the Maya architecture. And he also promoted the existence of Uxmal to the world. In 1836, he met travel writer John Lloyd Stevens in London. Uh, Stevens was from the United States. They read the account of ruins of Copan published by Juan Galindo and decided to try to visit Central America themselves and produce a more detailed and well illustrated account. The expedition came together in 1839 and continued throughout the following year, visiting dozens of ruins and resulting in the detailed description of 44 archaeological zones, many for the first time. Stevens and Catherwood were credited with the rediscovery of the Maya civilization and through their publications brought the Mayas back into the minds of Western world. The expedition resulted in the book Instance of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, published in 1841, with text by Stevens and engravings based on the drawings of Catherwood. Stevens and Catherwood returned to Yucatan to make further explorations, resulting in, in a second book, Instance of Travel in Yucatan, in 1843. While much work has been done in Uxmal between 1960 and 1970 to consolidate and restore buildings, Little in the way of serious archaeological search has been done. When I returned to Mexico City after studying the Shmal, I asked Dr. Ramon Pinichan at the museum why there were no archaeological reports available for the site, nor any obvious archaeological work underway. His first response was politics. He then added that the government felt it was much better to focus funds for archaeological work on sites closer to major population centers, where they could draw laborers and attract tourists. A major national park was being planned to preserve the natural environment around Uxmal. Note that the, the top floor of the museum here, in a view from the courtyard, that the facade was inspired by the buildings at Uxmal. Note the similarity of the second floor of the museum to the building on the right in this drawing by Catherwood. The city's dates of occupation are unknown because of the lack of archaeological work. The estimated population is guessed at about 15,000, but they really don't know. After about 1000 AD, Toltec invaders took over and most of the buildings ceased by 1100 AD. At least that's what they think. Maya chronicles say that Uxmal was founded around 500 AD by Hun Uxil Chactutl Zhu. For generations, Uxmal was ruled over by the Zhu family. It was the most powerful town in western Yucatan and for a while in alliance with Chichen Itza and dominated all the northern Maya area. Sometime around 1200, no new major construction seems to have been made of small, but that's 
probably the case, but they really don't know. It has been speculated that the cease of the construction at Usmal had to do with events at Chichen Itza. But again, that's a speculation. They really don't know. After the Zhu family moved the capital of Mani, the population of Usmal did definitely decline. Usmal was dominant from 1875 to 900 C.E. The site appears to be the capital regional state of the Puyuk region from 850 to 950 of the Christian era. The Maya dynasty expanded their dominion over the neighbors. This promise did not last long. After the Spanish conquest of Yucatan, in which the Zhu family allied with the Spanish, early colonial documents suggest that Uxmal was still inhabited by some people, perhaps a, a village in scale. But the, most of the people departed after a terrible smallpox epidemic in the 1550s. As the Spanish did not build a town there afterwards, Ushmal soon was largely abandoned. The region around Ushmal has largely returned to a natural state and has a very low population density. Road access to Ushmal has been greatly improved in the past 30 years. The archaeological zone has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Reed Resort Hotel Complex has been constructed in order to attract tourists. A sound and light show was inaugurated in 1975 with Queen Elizabeth II as the VIP guest. As a result, Ishmael now is one of the top 12 archaeological tourist attractions in Mexico. In contrast, it received very little visitation from foreigners in 1970 because of the difficulty of reaching the site and returning home the same day. You'll notice in my slides that there are very few people, and what people you do see are, are indigenous Mayas, probably from walking distance from the site. To, uh, to, to, there were very few cars at the site when we went there. Three Canadian school teachers accompanied me on all my visits to archaeological sites around Yucatan, uh, the state of Yucatan, rather. They were Lucy Bauclair from Montreal, Marcel Rondeau from Montreal, and Jeanette Lorondeau from Montreal. We first met at Chichen Itza. They were miserable. I think they were crying at the time. No one could understand their English, and they were trying to get medical help for their problems, a very serious dysentery. Earlier in August, I had camped out for several days with seven French uh, college co-eds from Lyon, and it refreshed my memory of French enough where I was able to communicate with the three school teachers, and in a combination of English and French, I was able to find out what was wrong with them, then use my Spanish in Merida to buy the medicine at a pharmacy. We became lasting friends after that. I always wondered what happened to them. Back in Merida, I quickly discovered that there were no tourist buses going to the most of the archaeological sites I'd been assigned by the museum. Uh, most also had third-class buses going by the site, but the, the schedule was such that often if you made it to the site in the morning in a third-class or second-class bus, there was no way to return home. I then made a bargain with a taxi driver there in Barra in that I would pay him a flat fee for several days of driving me around the state of Yucatan. He then gave me a discount if I promised to, to help his two teenage kids learn English. In other words, they could come along with me and practice their English. It was a good deal. Eventually, the of course, the Three teachers from Canada come, came with me. The initial segment of the journey south was past neat little Maya villages, uh, immaculately maintained, and a total lack of, of commercial signage. That quickly caught my attention. Along the way, we periodically pass old 16th and 17th century missions that had been developed when there was a greater rural population. Some had uh, houses around them and others appeared to be almost uh, abandoned as if they were hardly in use. We also passed some haciendas uh, that looked like they'd been abandoned for a long, long time. Some perhaps since the Mexican Revolution. Then we entered a almost an uninhabited, desolate region where the pavement on the highway narrowed to 
barely more than one lane. And as you see here, the, the cattle had priority over the traffic. We had to stop completely until we could get the cattle out of the way. Then disaster struck. In the middle of nowhere, we both had a flat tire and overheated the engine. Uh, I don't know how I could have both happen at the same time, but there we were stuck for about an hour until we got the engine running again. Shortly thereafter, we entered the Puyuk Hill Country, and it had a drastic difference in terrain change, but also a frightening difference in the highway. It became basically a gravel road with no siding. Can you see the distance between the, the sand gravel paving and the side of a ravine? The Puyuk Hill Country gets more rainfall as a result. Essentially, we were entering jungle, or you could even call it a rainforest. Whatever the case, you could not see more than a foot or two into the vegetation beyond the side of the highway. We then began driving through the, the ruins of a, of a large ancient city typified by piles of stones. Now this is a case throughout much of Yucatan. There are many, many archaeological zones that are typified by piles of stone. So when you see piles of stone here in the southeastern United States, especially in the uh, Appalachians or the Piedmont, it may indicate something pretty significant. The driver needed to cool off his engine again, so he let us do some hiking in around the ruins, and we came upon an ancient cenote, or natural sinkhole, where that particular city got its water supply. Deeper into the side of the city, the, the vegetation became true jungle. The trees extended at least 100 feet into the air. There are occasional spots, I guess you'd call them meadows or so, that, where the trees were short, it looked like at one time it had been pasture land because the trees there were 10 or 12 feet high, but it all overgrown and there was no sign of any habitation, so there's no longer being farmed. Here's some of the views of the, the shorter vegetation that was the understory for the trees. Then we came upon something that shocked me. Archaeologists and government laborers had cleared out the forest to reveal an ancient Maya road called a Sakpi. And there it was. You can see the stone trim. Evidently it was paved with gravel and sand. Not a whole lot different than parts of the road that we'd driven on. We kept on going a little bit away, maybe a, a mile or so, and then we had our first view of the Great Pyramid at Ushma. We were there. There were two Indians in front of us walking. I guess they were lived in the community when they were coming to pay homage to their ancient ancestral site. The Pyramid of the Magician is a step pyramid structure, unusual among Maya structures in that its footprint is an oval in shape, uh, the, instead of the more common rectilinear plan. This is known as the Rehobek style. It is found in several other Maya cities and towns in the Piyu Kills, but again, not common elsewhere. It was common practice in Mesoamerica to build new temple pyramids atop older ones, but here a newer pyramid was centered slightly to the east of the older pyramids, so that on the west side of the temple, the old pyramid is preserved with the near temple above it. The exact height of the Pyramid of the Magician is in dispute and is reported as tall as 40 meters or 131 feet and as low as 27.6 meters or 90.5 feet. Here you see clearly from a photograph from the west side that the original pyramid had a very different appearance and reflected a different architectural style. On the other side, the steps have only been partially completed and then a temple rises up from the steps and then above it is a much larger temple built at a later date. It is magnificent though the, the oval side produces a, a, a dramatic effect both at a distance and close up. Uh, more feeling like a, for, for lack of explanation otherwise, uh, like a gothic cathedral. This is a recent photograph of the Pyramid of the Magician made by the INAH showing the pyramid restored to its final appearance, which is quite a bit different than the, the view I had back in 1970. 
as you can see here these steps stopped about two-thirds up the slope of the pyramid when I was there. Now, I had one of the biggest scares of my life when I was climbing up the unrestored building near the foot of the pyramid. I got to the top and then this giant creature poked his face out in front of me and stuck out his tongue. Uh, he was maybe a foot away. The three teachers screamed in horror. Well, it was just a relatively harmless iguana, but none of the four of us have seen an iguana before, and we didn't know what it was. It looked like something from the dinosaur age. But again, he, he just kind of looked at me, and I looked at him, and no harm was done in the long run. Archaeologists currently believe that the nunnery quadrangle was built around the period from 900 to 1000 AD. Uh, again, though, without significant archaeological excavation underneath the building, how do you really know its age or what came before it? The name was related, of course, to the, the similarity to a Spanish convent back in Spain. There's no evidence that none's ever there. And in fact, the quadrangle consists of four buildings creating a large, extremely large plaza. Uh, it is assumed that these buildings formed the various functions of government. So what this more was like is a government center where the various functions of a Maya government were transacted. The Duffcote complex was another quadrangle directly adjacent to the Great Pyramid of the Magician. The Palace of the Governor was, was one of the largest, if not the largest, single buildings in the complex. Uh, it was one of the few that had a ceremonial stair facing an inner courtyard. This detail of the uh, Palace of the Governor is one of many that you see in Ushmal that suggests a origin in wooden architecture. Here's a detail of, of the uh, cartouche, which is said to symbolize the founder of the city. This ornate carved stone head represents Kukulkan, the feathered serpent, a very sophisticated piece of architecture. The House of the Turtle is another one of the large palaces within the complex. It stands alone. The vertical elements on the second floor clearly replicate the canes of a, a typical Maya or, or Creek Indian uh, summer house. Here's a detailed view of one of the turtles on the decorative chorus of the House of the Turtles. These buildings have not been restored yet. They're in astonishingly good condition considering their age is as much as 1500 years. Note the precise construction of this stone masonry in an astonishing condition. It's been sitting out in the jungle for over a thousand years. Here we see some details, some other parts of Ushmal. Most of these have had very little restoration work other than the cleaning. These trunk-like noses on the ornate trails of Chalk the Rain God at Ushmal led many people, so-called experts in the 20th century, to believe that the Maya civilization was founded by people from Southeast Asia, since there are no elephants today living in the Americas. That is not the case. Actually, it's probably inspired by the taper, which is a cousin of the elephant, a native to the Americas, or it was just strictly a uh, artistic treatment. This is a close-up view of the very precisely cut stone 
tunnels and blocks that were used to construct most of the ceremonial and public buildings in Ushmal. It's an exceptional architecture, uh, perhaps the zenith of architectural design in the Americas. Note that this decorative frieze portrays a house with wooden shingles, and to the side are its wooden lattice work. More proof that I think that the Ushmal site was occupied much earlier than they're now saying, that originally it was wood architecture. Here we have a view of four types of stonework on the sides of them that probably date from different periods of construction or different phases. Here's another view of the nunnery triangle. And a close-up of a beautiful uh, building with a latticework cornice. All the details on the second floor frieze replicate wooden architecture, yet they are carved from stone. Amazing achievement for people who, are, who didn't even have the use of, of iron tools. In the peak of touristism, you can see the Ushmal was virtually deserted. I think we were the only foreigners on the entire archaeological zone. Everybody else we saw were were indigenous Americans. In 1970, no restoration of work had occurred at the mortuary complex. They'd merely cleaned off the stones. In the foreground is a small ball court that also has not been restored at all. There is a larger ball court elsewhere on the site, you'll see, however. Here's another example of intricate thousand-year-old stone masonry that is in almost perfect condition. It's only been cleaned. We move on to an example of which is almost classic architecture. Note that how much these resemble Doric columns in, in Greek and Roman architecture. Here's an example of a vaulted passageway that later was altered by large stones. And here's an example of uh, reparations occurring at this at the time I was. This is the only activity I saw on the entire site by the INA. It was like he was an orphan child. Here we see a the house of dust, which still remains lost in the jungle. The the uh, spires rise above the. Uh, when I was there, absolutely no restoration work had occurred at the pyramid of the sorceress or the witch. As far as I know, it, that's still the case. It is unchanged. It's a fairly large pyramid. It's a twin to the, the, the male pyramid of the magician. Here's another unrestored pyramid at Ushmal. Again, I don't think any work has been done in the past 50 years to improve it. We'll now look at some passageways or portals most of them vaulted between buildings. These seem to have been added after the construction of the building. At least that's the opinion of archaeologists now. This view of the main ball cord illustrates how sophisticated the spatial planning and architecture was at Ushmal. This is architecture at its best, even though the ball cord itself has received very little uh, work other than cleaning the vines off. The goal that you see at Ushmal today is a reproduction. The original one is on display in the museum. This is how they found it. I, I kind of think there were maybe wooden stands associated with this ball court in addition to the, the earthen platforms for viewers to sit and stay. This stone Sculpture has traditionally been viewed as an altar on which was placed the hearts of sacrificial victims. First of all, uh, that form of human sacrifice was not common with the classic period bias, but it also was quite similar to some wooden thrones I've seen portrayed on stone carvings in other Maya cities. As we leave Ushmal on this program, I think this photograph of the cornice work on one of the buildings is an example that proves that Maya architecture ranks with the best in the ancient world. Keep in mind, this stone work has been there for over a thousand years, sitting in the jungle. 
It has only been cleaned, nothing else. If you have any questions about my presentation on Ushmal, please feel free to write them in the comments section. I will be uh, delighted to get back to you as soon as I can. Until the next time when we meet on the People One Part channel, have a great day.